Well, good morning again and welcome back. Uh, so this is our second morning session. We've got two longer in-depth talks this morning. Uh, first, we're going to talk about uh, TF, which is something that most of you, if you're using ROS, probably make use of pretty frequently, and, and we've got the author here to tell you about it. And then after that, we'll talk about multi-robot systems. Uh, so first, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, your ROS platform manager, Tully Foote, who had the um, wherewithal to name a very common package after himself. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. But um, I have to actually give you the credit for that. It was previously had a longer name. And due to the naming conventions that you implemented, we had to shorten it to just my initials. So yeah, I'm here to tell you about TF, um, the transform library inside of ROS. And I know there's a lot of different levels here, so I'm trying to get a little bit for everybody, um, which unfortunately means that there's going to be a little bit of redundancy for everybody. But stick with it. So <clears throat> motivation for TF. Many of you have seen the DARPA, urban cha uh, DARPA Grand Challenges and Urban Challenge. Um, I was lucky enough to be involved in all three of those. And there were challenges in the challenge. This is Alice from Team Caltech. Um, we had by far the most exciting finish of the race. Um, if you uh, talk to me later, I can show you the ca r robot's eye view of the ending as we go into the press box. Um, so as I was working on all of these um, vehicles, one of the things that kept coming up was how do we deal with sensor data, how do we fuse it, how do we keep track of it, and one of the big things was like, what happens when the GPS jumps? You know, GPS is not that good. Um, it updates occasionally, and um, all of a sudden you're like, I've collected all this data, I've put it in the map, and now I think I'm 10 meters from where I was, and I know the data that I collected a second ago is no longer valid. And so you start thinking about, well, I need to keep track of more coordinate frames. And as I continued on to the University of Pennsylvania team, my responsibility became doing a lot of the sensor collection and sensor fusion, and I kept banging my head against this problem of keeping track of all these coordinate frames, again, each project. So <clears throat> I didn't want to do it again. And I decided the best thing to do was write a library so that I never have to do it again. Maybe not the best logic, but it also means that many of you don't ever have to do this again. So there's a benefit. Um, <clears throat> there's also other significant uh, motivation for this was to be able to save processing and uh, data transport costs. Um, one of the primary motivations of TF is we were actually put the the stamp on every piece of data, and then the data gets transferred directly to the um, process that wants to use it, and they can mutate it the way they want. You don't have to guess what the next person in the pipeline will expect, want your data formatted in. And this also has great properties for preserving your data. If you're logging, you get the original data in its original form, and you don't have to worry about rounding and other things when we run multiple operations on it. So what is TF? TF is just a library that keeps track of coordinate frames for you and has nice methods to help you get from transfer data from one coordinate frame to another. So the primary ways to interact with TF are through using a publisher and a listener. Um, the publisher is just a helper class that will allow you to if you are something that knows about the co uh, coordinate frame, say the motor joint, the motor controller that's controlling the joint of the elbow, all you have to do is publish that from the upper arm to the lower arm, the angle is this. And it computes the transform, and then the library will take that in just as a d discrete element. And the other side of it is the more complicated side, where you listen to all these discrete updates from each different joint, and then you build a large tree of how, um, <clears throat> you build a large tree representation of what all the coordinate frames are in the robot, and then you can query over it. 
So as we were designing ROS, one of the critical things we looked at was that ROS is going to be running on a distributed system. And TF was designed precisely to be also distributed. There's no central part of uh, TF where there's a central server and everything and knows about everything. Each node is in charge of listening for everything on the system, aggregating it, and then providing access to it directly from when you query it. This is one of the most common failures of people who are trying to learn TF, is they bring it up and they ask it for something that happened before it got started, and it doesn't have data because there's no, you haven't been listening for data a second ago before you created your listener. So if any of you are having trouble with this, make sure to bring your listener up and keep it up um, so it can build its buffer of data. So I mentioned briefly the tree structure of TF, and I want to talk to you about the data representation underneath. So you've got your basic tree structure, you've got your world, you've got turtle one and turtle two here. And every publisher is publishing joint trans the transforms over time. Um, on the PR2, we're publishing at like 400 hertz. Depending on your application, you can choose to publish at a higher or lower rate, depending on what fidelity and update rate you want to be able to query the system at. And in the listener, we have these links that we've built up. And you can see that we're collecting, this one's a um, hundredth of a second old. It's got five seconds of data, and the average rate is 50 hertz. And this is stored in a linked list. And each different part of the link of the tree has a linked list as the data structure behind it. So when you query it, we're actually traversing the linked list. Um, by default, we store 10 seconds of data. That's just a parameter you can set in the constructor of your listener. Um, and the other interesting thing about TF is that it will work with multiple disconnected trees. So if you actually have two robots and they don't know, how, they don't know the transform between them, you can ask for the transform from the left hand to the right hand of robot one. You can ask for the transform from the left hand to the right hand of robot two. If you ask for the left hand of the robot one to the right hand of robot two, it will error and say those are not connected. But if at some later time somebody starts publishing the transform between robot one and robot two, the next query that you make, it'll work. So, <clears throat> the core of TF is the lookup transform method. Um, I've got an example tree here with two very simple robots. And we're going to walk through how to transform from the coordinate frame of robot one laser to the coordinate frame of robot two's base. Uh, this would be a common thing. Say, robot two is trying to do navigation, and it's receiving the sensor data from robot one. It wants to be able to know where it is in relation to its base so that it can do something like drive and not hit it. So these are the two no nodes on the tree that we're going to try and traverse between. And traversing a TF tree is actually relatively simple. You simply walk up it, compute the transform one between the laser and the base for robot one, compute the transform between the base and the odometry frame, then you compute the transform between the uh, Odom on the map frame, and then you go to the other side since we've hit the top, and we compute the transform between robot 2's Odom frame and the map, and it turns out that's just a little bit of linear algebra. All of a sudden you have the transform between these two things. There's some efficiencies under the hood. We do the uh, traversal of the tree first and then the computation of the transform later, it's slightly quicker, but you don't actually need to worry about that. So, each one of those links that I showed you walking through is actually a buffer of data. And depending on what data has been published, you may or may not have current data on every link. So, here's four different cases. Uh, in the top left, that is the great one. You've got all your frames up to date. Um, but in the top right, if you look here, say we haven't received this data quite at the time we're querying for, it's going to fail. And you're going to get, that's going to say there's an extrapolation uh, error into the future because the data is not quite up to where you're at. You can also get failures where um, different, uh, more common is you have this more moving wavefront where different data has come in from different nodes at different times because 
They're slightly farther away on the network. They're over the wireless. Um, again, that's going to fail. And you can also get things where if you query it before the transforms have been published for that timestamp, um, it will also fail. And here is one of the really, um, a lot of people make this mistake, which is that if you ask for time zero, TF will say, okay, that means you want the latest common time. And the way you compute the latest common time is you look at the front wave front of all these things, and then you take the minimum of it and you query at this point. However, if you're querying at that point, there's no common time and it will error saying, um, saying so. So even if you ask for the latest value and you have transforms over all your data type or all your different elements in the tree, you still may get an error. So <clears throat> inside of the cache, I've mentioned that there's stored as a linked list. We look up at the, to when we're looking up inside of linked list, we find the two closest points, and when, then we do linear interpolation between them. Um, we use spherical linear interpolation for the quaternions, and we just use regular linear, linear interpolation for the um, translations element. So if you have anything between time 10 and time 11, it's straightforward interpolation. And TF does have this thing called extrapolation. It will allow you to go beyond the closest two data points. Um, I added this in when I first wrote the library. It's a really trivial feature just to let the linear interpolation go beyond the ends of your two points. I have the, um, there is a method in there to turn it on, and I highly recommend that nobody turn it on. It turns out that, especially if you have a high update rate, when you have a small range that you're interpolating over, if you start extrapolating by anything, it basically will amplify your noise. It is great in the abstract, but I have not yet found a case where it has significantly improved performance, and it usually causes significantly impossible to debug problems in your system. Because all the data is valid, but you've amplified the noise, and then you're making decisions based on the noise, it just doesn't work. So, <clears throat> these are some of the values that I feel that TF provides to the community. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you save computational costs, you don't have to transform things multiple times. This also, this saves both in accuracy and just CPU cost. And the user doesn't actually have to worry about what frame that the data was collected in. They can say, I want it in this coordinate frame. It, the data is stamped. There should be data in the TF tree. Give it to me in the frame that I want, and I'll ignore the rest. And the best thing is that means that most users don't have to know anything about 3D coordinate transforms. Because I know way more than any of you ever want to know. Um, and the other important thing is that as we're running on a distributed system and there's significant latency, all of the, you can deal with data that comes in a little bit of, from a little bit ago. Um, if it goes over the wireless network, it gets buffered, it gets resent. The data comes in, it is not the current data. And the, on the other side, you can deal with if the TF transformations get delayed, we have methods to help with that. <coughs> so inside of TF, the core functionality is the lookup transform and can transform. I went over lookup transform, which will do the tree traversal and compute the transform between two coordinate frames. Can transform will do the same tree traversal, but it won't even bother computing the, uh, what the actual transform is. It'll just return you true or false, whether or not it can be transformed. It's much faster, and if you need to be polling it, um, at a high rate, you should use can transform. But most of us don't actually want to be dealing with transforms. Um, so you can actually just ask TF to transform your data for you. We have many different data types, uh, all those common uh, geometric primitives and things like point clouds. So you can just simply ask for your primitive in whatever coordinate frame you want at the time you want. 
So as I mentioned, we had a lot of issues dealing with latency in a distributed system. <coughs> the cache allows you to do that. But if the TEF data arrives after the primary data, what do you do? And this is the case when you have a laser scanner and you have somebody that's computing the, all the uh, joints and the transforms to get from your laser scanner to, say, your base coordinate frame. And if the computation of that's, um, that joint information takes longer or is delayed on the network, you have to be able to deal with that. So there's two basic ways to deal with this. You can either use wait for transform, which is your very simple way. You sit there and you say, can I transform, can I transform, can I transform? That's all wait, tra wait for transform does for you. But the much cleaner way to do it is to use a TF message filter. And I'm going to go into dangers of wait for transform. In general, it's only good for scripting if you're sitting here and you have a dedicated script that's going to do one thing and return when it's done. Um, if you're doing any asynchronous processing, you can actually delay your entire system, cause all downstream processes to be delayed due to the latency of your incoming uh, TF information on the network. And so the message filter is much, much cleaner. The way the message filter works is that when you subscribe to a piece of uh, a topic, it actually subscribes for you. It will put it into a buffer, and every time new TF data is called, it will check all the messages that are queued for you and hand, give you a callback just like you subscribe to it, but only when the, the transform is available. So you can keep your asynchronous processing paradigm, but when you get your callback for your data, you know that it has, well, it tested true that it has um, a transform available to the co coordinate frame that you asked for. However, don't make the mistake that that means that if you call transform on that object, it will work. Depending on how long your callback goes, there may have been updates to the TF tree that broke your transform. Um, so you still need to do the exception handling and all those things that you should do to keep it robust. So we got advanced topics. We're going to time travel. Um, it's also known as the advanced API. But when I was thinking about it, it's actually transforming data in time. It's a really tough concept. So time travel is what we called it under development. So this is a very simple example. Uh, the turtle bot's driving along. It sees an apple on the ground, and it keeps driving. And now you say, well, I want to drive a path around all known obstacles. Most of us, that's really simple. You just say, well, I saw the apple at this time in the map, placed it in the map, and then I kept driving. And this works great. But now, say I saw the apple, and it fell on top of the turtle bot. If you ask where the apple is now, it's still on top of the turtle bot. But how do we, how do we actually conceptually deal with that in when we're keeping track of this apple. And so the trick is that you have to know semantically where your data, where you believe your data is fixed in time. So what we're going to do is we're going to construct the transform from the observed obstacle to the fixed frame at the time the obstacle, the object was observed. Then we're going to um, jump, keep, preserve the data in the fixed frame. And following that, we will compute the transform from the fixed frame to the frame that you want to know where the apple is, know where the apple was. So here's uh, a bit of a rendering. Basically, you see the apple in the turtle bot frame. You know the transform for the world at time zero. You want to know where the apple is in the turtle bot frame at time five. So if you look at this, um, if, the, if you're doing the transform and the apple is in, fixed in the map frame, you simply take the product of the T0 and the inverse product of T5, and you're there. But if the apple is sitting on top of the turtle bot, it's here. Um, so we transform the apple into the turtle bot frame because that's our fixed frame. It stays there. And then you ask for the transform back to the turtle bot frame, which again is the identity transform. And you find out that the apple is just sitting on top of the turtle bot, where you just saw it. And the critical part is figuring out where your data is in this fixed 
what the semantic information of your data is that implies what the fixed frame is. Um, in general, it's where it's located. So, <clears throat> to give you a summary of a couple of our command line tools, um, I don't, so many of you may not be familiar with these, but I'm sure some of you are. TF echo, command line tool, it'll just simply print out what the transform is between two coordinate frames that you ask for um, as it's coming in, the latest time. TF monitor, if you're having trouble with latency and connectivity in your transform tree, TF monitor is a great tool. It'll let you understand what publishers are publishing, what TF transforms, and what the latency is on receiving those in your uh, monitor, which hopefully is a proxy for your other processes. And ROS WTF, great tool that Ken mentioned earlier. Um, it has a TF plugin. It will tell you things like um, this transform is being published with two parents very fast, which suggests that two people think they're the authority on this, or two nodes think they're the authority on this, and they're fighting. Um, when two nodes are publishing the same transform with different data, it's really, really bad because they will usually interleave. And then TF will do the nice interpolation for you, assuming that it's a continuous variable. So if you have two different transforms that are being alternately published, you will be somewhere in the middle randomly, depending on what your time, how your query lines up with the two different interleaf data flows. So that's definitely something to watch for. If you're having issues, I highly recommend ROS WTF. And any of you that are out there working on things, that you can see something that can easily be detected in a Python script, I suggest making a ROS WTF plugin. And also, if you're actually publishing transforms and trying to figure out how things are looking in your world, there's great tools. Arviz has a TF visualization plugin. Uh, it becomes a mess, but you can turn things off so you can actually see just the individual links. And also, view frames, which I showed you this tree structure earlier. Um, it has great information about the currency and the buffer information, so you can actually s look visually check what the um, different currencies are of your different transforms. And in particular, if somebody has stopped publishing a transform, you can watch it go out of date really quickly and know, hey, I gotta go check out that publisher. So <clears throat> there's lots of coordinate frames in the robot, and Dealing with coordinate frames is one of the harder things to do with TF. Um, you can see the PR2 here, it has many coordinate frames. And one of the important things is that when you're talking about coordinate frames, you need to be able to talk about coordinate frames. Both, both parties have to be able to talk about coordinate frames with the same name. Um, we do a lot of this by convention at the moment. And I highly recommend that as you're going out there and you're going to start using start using TF on a new robot or something, try to make sure that your coordinate frames are as closely named to the analogous ones and existing robots out there so that um, things will work more out of the box and you don't have to be reparameterizing every uh, frame ID. Of course, if you're writing a node that's gonna be generic, you should probably parameterize the coordinate, uh, coordinate frames that it uses so that you can reuse it without uh, recompiling. There are some uh, beginning standards for naming coordinate frames. Um, Rep 105 is coordinate frames for mobile robot platforms. And Rep 120 is coordinate frames for humanoids. Um, so if you're doing anything with mobile robot platforms or humanoids, I strongly recommend you follow these reps and state that you follow these reps. And the nice thing is things like the navigation stack will work if you follow these uh, reps. So a couple of tricks. Um, you can dynamically allocate, or dynamically create TF transforms just by publishing with a new coordinate frame. This is really useful when you're doing object recognition and you're like, hey, I saw something on the table at this coordinate in the se camera sensor. Let's just add it to the TF tree. You can add anything you want to the TF tree. It won't hurt it. And if you stop publishing, the, d the old cache data will be there, but it won't affect your future lookups. So be careful if you um, reuse the same frame ID for dy dynamically changing things. If I see a chair over there and I s name it chair one, and then 10 minutes later I see a chair over there and I name it cha uh, chair one, if you query for the chair position anywhere in between, 
you will get the linear interpolation between that side of the room and that side of the room. They're actually different chairs, um, and so that data is completely bogus. But TF will return it to you because you, you gave it the same frame in different places. And the other thing is to think about um, semantically important coordinate frames. So when you're, <clears throat> the best example I have this is the differentiation between the map frame and the ODOM frame in the navigation example. So going back to um, my grand challenge experience and the GPS jumps, one of the big things, you're, as you're driving along, you have this global localization that says that you're within 10 meters of this spot and that will have a best estimate and it keeps jumping. And so if you keep track of your data in the map frame, when you get an update from the GPS, all of a sudden you have the choice of do I try to keep track and recompute where all my data was because I got an update on my position, or do I just throw it out and start over because that's easier. But if you know that the car is gonna be driving forward in a continuous manner, and when you get a GPS update, you know that the obstacle that you saw one meter in front of you is still one meter in front of you, even though your estimate of where you are in the world changed, um, we can take advantage of that by keeping all of the, uh, persisting all the objects in the odometric frame. And we know that the odometric frame will drift, but we have this other coordinate frame, which is the map frame, and we can jump the uh, transform between the map frame and the odometric frame such that if you ask for a specific position in the map, you can drive to that point but the obstacles that you observed in the odometric frame will always be approximately where they are up to the level of the drift of your odometry. And this allows you to persist the obstacles in the odometric frame. The one caveat with this is that your odometric frame does build up um, drift over time, and so you need to make sure not to persist obstacles too long. And usually in a navigating robot or something like that, um, you drive out of the range of the, your persisting data before you um, drift too far to make it invalid. There's a trade-off there, but using the odometric frame is highly recommended. And when you're doing other system design parts, I think about the semantic meaning of where the data should be stored and how you want to update it when you get new information. And the last thing is, in general, I recommend using the TF message filters and not wait for transform in any case, almost every case. Um, it's a couple extra lines of code. You have to register a callback, but <clears throat> it'll save you debugging time down the road. So <clears throat> TF is not perfect. There are many challenges when using it. Um, transmission over Wi-Fi is a major problem. Um, on the PR2, it can take up to half the Wi-Fi link. And if you subscribe from multiple things on the other side of the Wi-Fi link, um, there, all of a sudden, you can hog all your bandwidth just subscribing to TF. There's a couple of scripts in the TF package which will actually subscribe to the whole TF tree and periodically publish one cross-section so that if you need a low bandwidth display, say on the other side of a Wi-Fi link for a user interface, um, you can get, do that over Wi-Fi with much lower bandwidth. Disambiguation of multiple frame, frame IDs on homogeneous robots. If I have two turtle bots, they both believe that their camera, is in, or their camera is in the camera frame. And if you publish data and you stamp it with the camera frame, all of a sudden you don't know which, if you don't know which robot that camera data came from, you're out of luck. Um, so you either have to remap all your parameters, um, and we're working on that. So another issue is that if you are only, if you have a little script that's gonna say, is the door open at this time, at this location, and it's gonna be queried like once a minute, if you're subscribing to TF all, for that whole minute, and then you just wanna query one little thing, it turns out that can take a non-trivial amount of CPU time just to keep the linked list updated. And in general, the bandwidth of TF is a problem, especially on the PR2 where we have 32 degrees of freedom, but we have something like 
100 coordinate frames because you know we keep track of all the different links. The cameras each have one or two coordinate frames depending on if you're doing optical frame and point clouds. Um, and one other big complaint about TF is that it has a lot of uh, heavyweight dependencies. So goals for TF in the future, I'd like to rework it to be a C++ library. Um, take advantage of templates to be able to break a lot of the dependencies so that you can TF the library, does not have to have the dependencies, but um, you can just depend on a header to add your support for your data type. Um, the Python library is there, it works. Um, it has a couple of quirks because it's wrapping the high-level C++ library and it turns out that wrapping ROS CPP inside of ROS Pi, there's a lot of things you have to jump, a lot of hoops you have to jump through. And also, as I mentioned, the bandwidth issue, we can cut a lot of the data out of the bandwidth if we don't have to publish static transforms regularly as the current system requires. And also to help with the bandwidth issue, we can actually have um, a client server type model so that you can have one big buffer that keeps track of all your data and if you just want to query it periodically and you don't care about the latency, um, you can just do a remote query to get it. And the good news is TF2 exists. It's in the geometry experimental package. Um, we have several projects that are using it already. People are quite happy with it. It's orders of magnitude faster. It has significantly lower dependencies. It has better unit tests, it has documentation. Um, all that's remained to do is merge it in in a backwards compatible way. So, related to that, since I'm on the podium, I'm gonna mention the Groovy SIGs are, uh, the proposal period is closing this weekend. Um, these are the ones we have currently on the website. If you have been talking at a BOF, I recommend um, if you're interested in pursuing that as a development effort for Groovy, please put it up here, get it documented so the rest of the community can know about it. And a uh, nice shameless plug for my boffs that I'm organizing. Um, over lunch, I'm gonna be doing a boff on the future of TF. If people are interested in actually getting TF2 into the system, I'd love to talk to you, uh, know about your use cases. It's not stabilized yet, so that means we can still tweak the API, add features, and also at 3.30 during the break, uh, we have the new build, build and release system we've developed in Fuerte. We're going to be um, deploying it into Groovy for public, uh, outside of Willow Garage. We've been dog booting it in Fuerte and now we're ready to start sh showing to other people. If you're interested in trying that out, getting in before we start recommending it for public use, uh, I'd love to see you. So. Questions? So TF2 is fully functional. I would, um, there's one open ticket against it, which is the debug strings are slightly out of order. Um, we have several projects within Will Garage using it that people using it have been quite happy. Um, if you want to start using it in its current form, um, be aware there will be probably a namespace change, but other than that, uh, yes, you can go ahead and start using it. The API is fairly stable. It's been, I actually developed it like 18 months ago. Um, it's, a, it's not a very big divergence from the TF API. Um, the backwards compatibility way that I plan to deploy it is that um, I believe I can actually take the entire TF API and just call through to TF2 underneath. Uh, so we only have to have one implementation in the system. So the question is, um, if you know a lot of the transforms around principal axes, um, could we reduce the bandwidth and put that into TF2 to actually have knowledge of what the coordinates, uh, what the specific um, transforms are, so you can only send one data, or one, one value instead of the full six, or seven, sorry. Um, that is a possibility for the future. That's not in TF2. Uh, we've stuck with the exact same. Uh, TF2 and TF are completely compa wire compatible. Um, so we haven't, I haven't gone to data compression at that level. So the question is, is there a tool that show? I had the graphs of the um, buffers and how they can fail, whether it's for, out, out of the front or out of the back. Um, the best tool I can recommend right now is view frames. Um, which gives you the tree structure and it, it'll tell you the length of the buffer and the, last, and the most recent one. Um, so you can, from that, you could, 
you can pretty quickly figure out which one is out of date. Um, and you also have the, in all the exceptions, it has the frame ID, or it, it'll tell you what frames you've queried between, so then you can just traverse the tree manually and view it. Um, definitely a tool that would give you the bar graph, the sliding bar graphs would also be interesting. Uh, sure, uh, so the question is, uh, can you explain the buffer server client, uh, the client server buffer relationship? Um, so basically, we, in TF2, we took the basic way that you inter interact with TF and made it an abstract base class, so it's just an interface. And then um, there's the data storage, which ha provides that interface. But then there's also another class which will provide that interface, and instead of querying a local buffer, it'll go out over an action, uh, action lib and query another, uh, if you've instantiated a buffer with the action server on it, any client with the action client can just point to that server and say, hey, what's the transform between A to B? Um, we've added some extra timeout, so you can actually time out um, your queries and it'll come back and throw an exception to you saying, I couldn't get it after a second. The network may be down, the transform may not be available. Um, so you can set the timeouts to do these remote queries at a, with higher latency, uh, but you don't have to incur the cost of keep maintaining the local buffer. So the URDF tools, um, the question is how do TF and URDF relate to each other? Um, the robot modeling tools know how to publish TF based on the URDF. Um, there's no connection backwards. Um, and the URDF and all those things, the URDF defines all the frame IDs for, those, for the, all the links in the robot. Uh, no, if you... Uh, Loading a URDF does not. There is a tool, I believe it's Robot State Publisher, uh, which takes in the joint state messages and the URDF and publishes the TF transforms for you for the entire URDF. Uh, we don't have computing Jacobians. Um, or sorry, the question is, do we have plans to put computing Jacobians into the tra uh, TF? Um, no one's actually asked for that, so I haven't been looking at that. Um, there are some rudimentary support for computing twists through the tree, um, but that's, that's all we've looked at beyond uh, static transforms. We have not, so the question is, has anyone looked at benchmarking TF? Uh, we have not benchmarked TF um, in any specific way. Uh, in this cycle of rewriting for TF2, we took like three orders of magnitude out of the performance, but nobody was complaining about performance previously. Um, I have had one request for slightly higher performance. Uh, Thomas R. from Tum, um, he's, doing the t he's doing the uncertain TF and he's querying it really fast in a whole sort of a whole array of transforms and he's asked, started asking for performance improvements. Um, but in general, uh, we're, you can do it at many kilohertz, approaching a megahertz to query the tree. So I haven't, people have not asked for performance information.